joined today by Richard Vaughnton. We know each other for quite some time. We bump into each other in the trade shows. We'll chat, we talk, we worked on some projects together. Yet, I really don't have any idea who you really are. And this is why I invited you today to kind of share your story. Welcome, Richard. Yeah, thanks, Flo. Yes, I, I tend to keep my uh, history well covered. Well, we'll change that today. Let's jump right into it. Tell me a little bit where you grew up in England. Well, I only grew up three miles from where I sit now because I eventually came back home uh, for all sorts of reasons related to children. But I was born in Paynton, which always gives everybody a very good laugh because in the UK, it's recognized as being one of those places which is a seaside holiday resort that was great in the 70s, but not so great in the 2020s. Okay. Which coast? Uh, it's the southwest coast of Devon in a bay called Torbay, which is uh, Torquay, Paynton, and Brixham. It, it's known by most, most people will say, oh, I've been to Torquay on a stag night or with their parents or something like that. Okay. But it's a fabulous place to live. It has its upsides, it has its downsides. Okay, um, How did growing up there impact your view on the world and what you wanted to be in life at some point? Ah, well, that's a relatively easy question because I spend most of my time uh, either in the water or on the water or on the beach. Um, in those days, there was no internet. There was virtually no television, and all you could do was go outside. And, and uh, I was either fishing, snorkeling, scuba diving, or just messing around on the beach. And, and of course, what happens? You know, you, you you go to school, you try and figure out where you're going to go, what you're going to do. Well, at least the teachers are trying to push you to decide what you should do or not do. Um, hormonal young boys tend to just go, go slightly crazy. Um, well, you really wanted to be a marine biologist, like probably half the planet at that point in time. Um, that was the ambition, probably from the age of 10 or 11. So it, it, it never materialized like that, of course. I understand that. So was that at least a, a trade you got into or how did your studies go on from there? Yeah, well, um, I did in what was in those days O-levels and did relatively well in my O-levels. I got like 13 of these things uh, in various disciplines and then I moved on to A-levels, which is the the normal trajectory. And then you would go to university, much the similar these days. Um, uh, unfortunately, university those days was paid for uh, and when I was the first week of my A levels, my uh, father died, unfortunately. So I kind of went off the rails a little bit, I suppose, educationally. I didn't really address the uh, the need to uh, work very hard. I started, um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't good, and I, and I guess if I had actually worked very hard, I still probably couldn't have gone to university because it was paid for. But you just mentioned something that's really my biggest nightmare. Um, like my kids are eight and 10 now, and I do travel quite a bit. And when I do travel, I think kind of really the worst thing that could happen would me kind of disappearing for an accident or whatever it might be. And um, since I do travel quite a bit, my kids do let me feel that that's the case. And uh, it was uh, Father's Day the other day here in Spain. And my son, the eight-year-old, who I'm very close with, he um, gave me a card. He painted me a Father's Day card. And he wrote, Dad, I'm really sorry you missed my uh, first two concerts. Happy Father's Day. Um, <laughs> that's, that's horrible. So he's, he found a talent in playing the viola. And because I missed his birthday and his two first uh, concerts, and I did, I did kind of recognize passive aggressive message there. Um, you weren't there. Happy Father's Day. Um, so yeah, I know that's that's kind of rough. Yeah, it's it, it is it is yeah it is difficult. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I've, I've traveled very extensively over the period of what you might call my career. Um, and although I'm very close to my kids right now uh, and I've worked with them and, you know, they live close by, uh, they do remember, and maybe it's jokingly when we're in the pub, they are always saying, you know, well, you're never there, Dad, were you? <laughs> so, 
you know, you have to you have to make of it what you can, I guess, going forward. But you know, I always brought presents home, and I always made sure I was playing with them and going down the beach with them and everything as much as I possibly could. But you know, it, it, it's the impact of not being there for a while, I guess. I agree. So going back to kind of your education, so you did did a bit of a detour. Um... Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, and I did. I, I did take my A levels. I didn't do very well. Um, I kind of helped my my mother repair bicycles because they had a cycle shop. That was my weekend job, um, amongst others, being in uh, working in uh, local kitchens and ice cream parlors and all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it was like, what am I going to do? Um, and I got offered a job uh, in microbiology at the local pathology uh, department in the local hospital, provided I, um, I, I do qualifications in it uh, part time, which I did for the next four years. Um, so I became a qualified medical microbiologist. Um, and that was a stepping stone to greater things and even more craziness in my life. Because that's that's so, how you then build a career in that uh, field. Well, that's that's the theory. You can you can stay in that or do something else. But I got offered a locum in Saudi Arabia for three months doing the same thing in a military hospital. So I went there for three months. I got off the full time post. When I came back, I packed my bags packed my wife up because I got married fairly young as well uh, and headed off to uh, Saudi Arabia for the next six years. Um, what what which, year is this now? Uh, that's a really good question. It would have been 1979 I did the locum. 1980 okay. I'd have gone there full time. Um, so that ended up in, in divorce as you'd expect in an expatriate environment. Um But some really, really interesting times for six years. I mean, if anybody's listening and they've been an expatriate, are an expatriate, they'll recognize the uh, the influence it can have on your life yeah. and the memories it stamps on you as well. So I won't tell you what I did because of, because because <laughs> I don't think it's appropriate, but I did some stuff which is probably pretty illegal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how's 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 life in Saudi Arabia in general? Because I lived in England, I lived in Ireland, now I live in Spain. Well, you've got obviously your differences to to Germany, but at the end of the day, you're still in in Europe, and uh, yeah. people eat pizza and drink beer and watch football, that sort of thing. But uh, Saudi Saudi Arabia, I imagine. Well, um, it's a little no, bit we different. we drank a lot of beer, ate a lot of pizza, and watched a lot of television. None of which we should have done, of course. Mm. Um, but I mean, in 1979, it was an incredibly free society, okay. actually. Um, but as the years progressed, it, it became, um, I just suppose, more religiously intolerant. Um, and by the time I left, or by the time I was evicted, um, the whole thing had, uh, had become much of a lockdown. Hold on, hold on, know. hold on, hold on, let us step back. When I got evicted, um, yeah, I was, yeah, it's probably not, it's probably not for online stuff, but uh, it was, it was amicable, but it was uh, under duress for some activities that were not appropriate to the okay. country I was living in at the time. So, uh, in re on reflection, many of these things you do, you realize how stupid it is, but when you're young, you're immortal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I've been there. Not in we can Saudi talk Arabia, but okay. Yeah, we can talk about that over a beer. Flow we'll we'll do, and then uh, I'll let the people know either way. Um, no, I won't. Um, okay, so you're you're leaving Saudi Arabia. Um, you're still kind of working in that field. Yeah. Was it was yeah. that a solid replacement to being a marine biologist? Because it's kind of no. No, no, not at all. No, marine biologists in my fantasy world of traveling the world with a scuba oh. gear and uh, enjoying the sunshine and meeting interesting people. It was that, that I didn't inhabit that environment. You know, I was very much laboratory based, science based. You know, uh, I was training in Saudi. I was also training Filipinos and various other nationalities to do this job too. Yeah. So, I mean, on leaving, 
I uh, fortunately been offered a job uh, in the commercial part of the, the microbiology world, essentially. So I I got offered a job as a, a product manager for a microbiology range being sold to laboratories okay. uh, on an international basis. So I went to Scotland and worked for a year in Scotland, being trained up on this these systems and also cell culture systems and various other things associated with that biomedical type of um, um, the world laboratory business. And still um, vacation rentals nowhere on the horizon, no, just no, maybe no. a vacation completely I, oblivious to that industry. Well, it, the commercial side of stuff is very interesting. I then moved to Italy and lived in Italy for two and a half years, but worked in Lugano in Switzerland and worked in Milan at an international headquarters for uh, biomedical uh, equipment and biomedical diagnostic. So, I mean, that was my next five, six years of my life becoming very commercial in, in absolutely everything related to international business. Yeah. And you, uh, you had already kids at that time. I had uh, my first child when we left Italy. Okay. Um, and that would be, um, that's a really good question. So Danny was born in 1990. So I'd have been heading back to the UK around about 1990. Okay. Because um, that, that, the whole kind of like Saudi Arabia, Scotland, Italy, um, if you have little kids, not not easy. But yeah, it's by the way. Well, it, yeah, it seems to be, it's a bit of a, I've seen it with a lot of other people. People tend to go home when they have small children. Yeah. And it, it's often related to education and healthcare and making your life easier with relatives and things. So yeah. we didn't really have any relatives you know, mothers, but they weren't terribly well, either of them. So we had to go back to the UK to High Wycombe um, because uh, the company I was working for got acquired by a big pharmaceutical firm. Um, and that's a very long story I won't go into because my boss was the Prime Minister of Yugoslavia at the time. <laughs> so, um, and then they decided to shut the international offices and I just moved to the UK and bought a house. Um, got off the job in California um, without a contract. <laughs> so I decided I'd stay. I got off a job in um, uh, with an Italian company helping them market biosensors, milk biosensors. Still not in vacation rentals at this point, but it's not far off because in 1992, I got offered a... Um, I am really old, actually, saying all that. In 1992, I got offered a job with an ex-distribution partner from the, the Italian Swiss days to start a business in the UK in biomedical and diagnostic distribution. So I invested quite a lot of money, my own money at that point in time, to start the business. And they supplied me products, uh, expertise, and asked me to be the distribution network for the Middle East, Africa, and Indian subcontinent, um, because I'd had a, a lot of experience of selling to those countries and building distribution networks. So I started that in 1992 in High Wycombe, which is uh, northwest uh, London by about 20 miles. Yeah. Um, and throughout the next, up until 2009, we went from nothing to a flotation in 2000. Um, I cashed in shares. I ended up in business with, I don't know, 70 staff. One of the proudest, moment, proudest moments in all that is probably uh, starting an assembly operation in India. I moved the business down to where I am now, where I was born, mm. um, an assembly operation in Paynton. Um, and starting probably the best service branded business franchise to nine countries in all those years. So that was that was good. But guess what happened in the year 2000 when we floated? I ended up with some money. <laughs> so what did we do? We went and bought ourselves a residential block of apartments, 14 apartments. And my wife started renovating and managing it. She's really good at this sort of stuff. We had a cottage in the grounds. And we discovered that the 14 residents were a lot of trouble. We discovered the cottage that we rented in the summers 
they left after seven days and they paid us more money. So we sold the residential and the cottage and we went and started buying ourselves uh, holiday properties overlooking the sea, doing all the marketing, doing all the distributions, doing the, all the renovations. And we ended up with six owned properties and two leased properties. Um, and that, that is, was... That, on that, on that note, like what, what technology were you using? <laughs> a, fax, a fax machine? Uh, what else? <laughs> you know... I've been asked that question by very young people and and it was in the infancy of the internet of course mm -hmm. so you know websites were something hey really brand new and we could see that this was the way you're going to start getting bookings and it was in the infancy of us direct and vrbo and everything else so we still took checks you know those written things people do And about 50% of our guests came back the following year. So that was great. Um, we got into the websites, and this is kind of one of those, I, I'm going to call it a genius moment, but it's a stroke of luck. Mm. I started looking for uh, web domains that were relevant, that were going to try and bring us some business and traffic. Yeah. The biggest town around here is called Torquay, and it's an extremely well-known tourist destination you know, as I said, in the 1970s, but still is. Um, and all of a sudden, I saw an advert saying, talkie.com is for sale. And I went to see this guy, and uh, he said, I've been trying to send, I've been sending letters out to all the local businesses, hundreds of them, to see if they want to advertise on talkie.com. He says, I haven't had one reply. I said, well, were well, you selling it. How much, how much do you want for it? And he said, well, I need to, I, I want to buy myself a car and send my kids to university. So I want 5,000 pounds for it. So I've got a thousand pounds in my pocket, if you'll take that. And he went, I'll take it. <laughs> and that generated probably 80% of all our bookings. One single website that was totally dominant locally. Because people search for that destination at that point in time, and you didn't have so many pay-per-click ads or anything, and the the big OTAs were, didn't have that massive presence at that time. So we did everything. We did absolutely everything. And my son built our own uh, PMS system, and we're a completely we're a completely self-catered uh, family when it comes to technology. So I've got two software developer sons that are actually really good. My wife's a professional photographer and interior designer, and now is also very good at building work. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we were completely self-contained, but guess what happened? We were cleaning toilets every weekend. We were dealing with guests. We had well, the stress levels just increased the bigger we got. So in 2006, we said, let's sell the whole portfolio um, and go and buy an apartment in Italy. Because that's where we got married. This is my wife I met as I was just before I left Saudi Arabia as well. Yeah. Um, so we sold it all just before the crash. So, you know, there was me thinking, we're going to have a crash. I need to sell the properties. Not really. It was just a complete, complete luck that we sold just before the crash. Went to Italy um and uh bumped into a chap who wanted to start a holiday rental business in italy so we got websites we got payment solutions we got banking we knew all about marketing we got everything we had a partnership together and we started a business in italy called lake coma homes the website still there still takes bookings 2006 10 properties It grew to 600 over 10 years um and That was getting into sizable vacation rental business with all the headaches that come with it. Uh, in the middle of all that, the OTAs decided that they were going to steal a march on normal marketing people. Um, Airbnb started up in 2008, as you know, and we know what the whole, the whole thing looks like right now. But in the middle of all that, because I've just got this habit of looking at starting new things all the time, Uh, we built a vacation rental, holiday rental business here in Torbay uh, called Discovery Holiday Homes. Um, that grew to 130 properties over about five to six years. 
uh, which we sold in 2016. Uh, kind of wish it hung on to a bit longer because the multiples have gone up and the values have gone up as the big acquisitions have happened, but we still made very decent money out of it. Um, we dissolved the partnership on the Italian stuff in 2016, 2017 as well. Um, in the middle of all that, I'd started Rentivo, which was an, uh, which was an assistance to the management companies originally in terms of technology. Yes, t uh, let's touch quickly on Rentivo because this is how we got to know each other. So for people who don't yeah. know what Rentivo is. Yeah, um, so we started it as a, a support infrastructure to the management companies. And it was uh, founded by me and a chap who used to work for me in the summers doing software development for the service business I mentioned earlier. Mm. He's called Chris Atkinson. He uh, he did a law degree. He ran a gaming business from his university room, uh, but he didn't want to do law. He wanted to do something in software. So we started Rentivo. He helped us with those businesses in terms of the infrastructure to software. And then we moved it on to creating websites for small uh, users. Probably a bit like Boostly is these days, but there's a lot more technology available now and a lot more marketing reach. And we were certainly weren't as good as Mark Simpson is in terms of actually outreach and marketing. Um, and we ended up with about 600 owners running websites for them. And, uh, but it was quite tortuous to be quite honest uh, so what we decided to do pardon me i, I seem to have a another what, covid flight issue um we decided to um go for crowdfunding in 2016 um to build a, a SaaS software package that would cover ems uh, channel management which is kind of an ETL system and uh, bolts on a much more professional web builder. Mm. In 2017, we finished the crowdfunding in dollar terms, about half a million dollars. Um, and we invested all our time and effort in actually building this infrastructure. Um, and we also acquired Click Asia, which was a small PMS uh, in Asia with some booking websites that came with it as well. So, um, yeah, the, the sales grew, the customer base grew. It was still still quite tortuous in many ways because, as you know, Flow, technology never stands still and everybody wants everything and they want it now and they want it for nothing, you know, which is not a good place to exist in. Um, so our best month of sales uh, was January 2020. Um, and we know what happened in February 2020, COVID. Um, and like most technology companies on the planet, they uh, we all got hammered. Um, where, where were you when uh, COVID hit? Do you remember? Kind of when lock, lockdown started? Because also in England, it obviously was different than on the continent. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, there's a few other things in there that I haven't really covered because the company Rentivo was actually working very well in terms of growth and software development and, and trajectory. And I was more of a door opener than actually somebody who could code or be a serious, proactive, hands-on marketer and everything else with it. Because I'd actually been running companies, <laughs> which, which means it's all about strategy and financial management and, and trying to look over the horizon. So uh, I, I got offered a job by Stay Alfred. And we all know what happened to stay out for it, but um, they asked me if I wouldn't mind becoming VP of Europe to grow their business. And that was in late 2018. And so I spent all of 2019 um, working to acquire businesses throughout Europe to bolt on to the, the stay out for it, three and a half thousand Germany master lease uh, apartments in, in the United States. Because they, they looked like a proper rocket ship pre-COVID? Well, honestly, they were a fantastic team. Yeah. You know, Jordan Allen and all the people he'd recruited were just a fantastic team to work with. Yeah. Uh, and you're right, that industry was rocket ship industry. Um, there's a lot of people out there who say, well, that was just crazy. I don't know how that was ever going to work. Actually, 
your rent to rent and your master lease, if there's no economic turmoil going on and you get the numbers right and you manage it properly, I'm sure it can be very successful. Um, I don't even want to get into the discussions about any of those companies that still exist or the ones that hit the wall, but I, I do actually believe they had the team that would actually make it work. But what do you do when you don't have enough cash, cash in the bank and you've got that many properties on master lease and 300 staff, offices, marketing, everything else? You have to close the door unless unless somebody comes in on a on a, a white night, for example. So yeah, so that was yet another uh, crushing blow. Uh, I had some decent share options in that as well. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I was I was actually here. But I did actually have to make phone calls to people who thought their companies were going to be acquired as well, um, which wasn't the most pleasant thing because once you've been offered money, you tend to spend it before it's actually in your bank account. Um, but yeah, so COVID was was a bit of a killer. Um, and I don't, well, many people haven't recovered from it. And I think small technology companies are the ones who probably suffered the most. So, yeah, that was Rentivo. Uh, I, we decided not to continue with SaaS. We continued to uh, look after our own booking channels um, and actually just core businesses as opposed to going out there and competing with the... Well, I've, I heard somebody say 1,000 other systems the other night. You know, it's going to be 200 to 250, which are actually challenging on a geographical level, but... Mm -hmm. Because you, know, you, you were very, more into then tailor offer, offering tailored solutions to a kind of larger agencies. Yeah, that's what, that's, what, that's what we gravitated to. We created a, a, one of these extract transform load systems whereby we started integrating with other PMS systems. We don't, I'm not interested in, in selling a PMS. Uh, integrated with other PMS systems, integrated with other channels. Uh, aggregated the data, created building marketing platforms for people in particular niches. So that was that was becoming relatively successful as well, um, and that that was going to be our long term long term goal in actual fact, because we could see SaaS was going to become much more difficult. Um, and you need you need a lot of money behind you to actually grow the volume that you actually need before you can sell it on to the next company that needs to grow to sell it on to the next company. And I think we lost the, we'd lost the enthusiasm to, to chase the big money to lose your lives actually working for other people at that level. Um, and I do know some companies in COVID who, who, who were scaling, they were going very quickly, and then they, they lost their way in COVID because they lost all their customers or their customers weren't paying or they weren't out of business. And they got their equity diluted out substantially in that period of time. And those companies now, those founders are, well, they're working for awards at the end of the day and they're working for salaries, but it, it isn't what it would have looked like if COVID hadn't actually happened. So, so yeah, you get... You get a little jaded occasionally by some of these things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Rentivo sits there at the moment. It's it's got a number of things going on in the background which are very interesting. Uh, it's a much more um, focused business, uh, working with uh, enterprise level businesses as well. Um, uh, but as you probably guessed, I just like starting things. So I worked for Stay Alfred and I did a year with uh, Properly as well uh, as they came out of COVID. Uh, I started a consultancy business um, with a partner in the US called Eric Mason, who a lot of people will know. Um, we both do our own thing. I'm very focused on M&A stuff for the last two years. So I've been helping people buy and sell their businesses. That's been really interesting and it's definitely a, a a hot spot. It's something that we're going to see a lot more of in Europe as, as time moves on. Um, and I've been working with a couple of really nice companies on growth and building their business too. So, do you, do you think COVID stopped and killed some of the businesses out there? It was 
fuel for other companies and, and possibly sped up a process that might have happened at some point anyway over a larger time frame? Yeah, I think the ones that actually got momentum, the ones that could actually see they were going to be profitable, you know, in a shorter period of time, I think they uh, they would have gone out and hunted more funds very actively, and they would have they would have certainly received them. I think because I mean the smart people can see outside COVID, and they can see the debris that is left behind, you know, and there won't be so many companies going forward. And I think we're already witnessing that in terms of roll-ups in technology, roll-ups in management companies, um, and large corporations beginning to dominate nearly every space here as well. So I think COVID pushed a lot of small companies back and probably helped the, what were going to be successful companies drive forward more aggressively, actually. So unfortunately, we weren't in that space to drive forward much more aggressively because we didn't actually have 10 million in the bank so we are so now now you're focusing most of your time on the on the consulting business yes i am yeah i mean i still i still work within rentivo and we have we have plans for that which i can't really say too much about um, sure but uh, i do a fair amount of consulting work uh, and i'm particularly focused on a uh, small mna business um i see that as being a big growth area particularly in in europe so in, in the united states everybody knows that there's been lots of roll ups for casa in particular and then you got steve myler and vtrips in the uk we Probably seen about 150 companies rolled up over the last few years by Aways and Sykes and Travel Chapter and various others. So they're both kind of mature. They've still got interest there, but there's some very big players in those spaces. But in Europe, it's still, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of small managers. No one's really figured out yet how to actually roll those up into a profitable concern with a half decent brand attached that is recognized in the industry. Sure, I mean, we've got companies like Guest Ready out there with 5,000 properties. My old buddy, Harold Loverdink, with Happy Dot Rentals with a couple of thousand properties and stuff. But there's no real substantial business apart from your Nova Souls and your Bell Villas, your, your OEO. Yeah, OEO. you're into home. You're into homes and your bungalow.net. Yeah. But what do you like if you could um like look into the crystal ball? Um do you think that maybe at some point it's gonna be large brands with ten thousand, twenty thousand, forty thousand properties, and on the other side, just the individual homeowner who's kind of semi professional and like myself, if I'm not in the house, I'll rent it out to guests. But if not, I just want it as a escape pot from the busy city and that the mid kind of crowd might disappear because they're being out uh, technology and out marketed. Yeah. Okay. Well, that crystal ball is very cloudy as everybody knows. So I, I think if you took, you probably have to take these in, in, in segments. Uh, one of the things I'm always saying is you really must split your earn from your leisure markets and destinations, mm. you know, your urban markets are under pressure. They're under pressure for licensing and legislation. And I think that's going to that's gonna come down the line. And there's going to be financial pressures on VAT and all sorts of things happening as well. So you're still going to have an urban market. It's, it's going to be much more controlled. How is that split between owners and managers? Well, my, my personal opinion on this is, I think you'll you'll see eventually you will see super managers, but they will have local operations. Mm. That is especially in leisure destinations. It's very hard to create a a a, a very large super manager unless you've got a local presence that has authority. That's a very simple thing in the in the leisure sector. In the urban sector, 
I think we're going to see a lot more developers coming in. Those developers are going to be in, you know, permanently in real estate. You're going to see a lot of better quality properties. You're going to see a lot more automation in it. And I think you're going to see super managers in that space as well. So, you know, your Airbnbers, yeah, they're going to be there, but they're going to have to step their game up. And, and that probably ans answers the question as to why Airbnb right now is talking about professional management. And maybe they should get into that space to actually address that. So I, I don't see any way you can avoid very large management companies coming into the space in Europe. I mean, I know a couple right now that are actually hoovering up individual properties and small managers because they've identified the fact that there are none of these businesses out there. Hmm. So what do you do? Do you try and wait to find a company with 5,000 properties to sell to you? Or do you start small and network them together aggressively as possible and as fast as possible and use technology to do it, stick your brand on it, you know, standardize everything related to operations and management. So if you ask me a vision, I'd say the target market is Spain, Portugal, France, maybe Germany as well, um, for these companies to start funded companies to seriously start looking at hoovering up small businesses and networking them together with local offices and under a single brand. It's like what's happened in the UK. It's very mature here. Yeah. You know, travel chapters got well, like 15,000 properties and probably 50 brands, local office brands, Sykes cottages, probably 20, 25 similar type of thing, a ways different business model. Don't seem to have very many local offices, but uh, you know what it's like, Flo. If if you want to buy a property, what's the most important thing to you if you've bought a property and you want to rent it out? Well, asset management. You want your asset. It's an expensive part of your life. You want it looked after. You want an income, of course. Yeah. You want reporting. You want to be able to phone somebody. It's a very personal thing. And that's probably why the large company see bigger churn than the small companies i wonder i read an article the other day in, in a german newspaper about a hotel chain i think it's hotel one if i remember the name correctly and um what what i found interesting is they differentiate themselves where they don't do revenue management they have on 300 days a year a fixed price and that's part of their brand building wow where, and they don't have a gym they don't have a restaurant they don't have a but it's um high-end design you've got a luxurious feel um but always on a budget so i think they just increased their rates from 69 euros to 79 euros a night and it's fixed and i thought it was really interesting that their owner kind of said we want that people kind of get a high-end experience but without the bells and whistles, because that's kind of uh, costing me money. And now for me personally, with my current role, I thought it was interesting that they negate revenue management as part of their brand strategy. But it made me wonder if that would also be a possible kind of play in the short-term rental market where you create an established brand uh, possibly purpose built. I know Steve Milo is kind of um, having a go at that. Yeah. Where it's also kind of this we're in this in this wild segmented fragmented industry where n you never know what you'll get until you're actually in the property. Whereas with <laughs> hotels, at least you have an idea of what a five star is, even though there's also shabby five stars. But that hotel one made me kind of think about you could create kind of a brand with a certain standard and people go like yeah sure i'm going to uh, and not say i'm not i'm renting an airbnb but then i'm renting a whatever the price yeah. name would be yeah I, 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 it's an enterprising idea isn't it but i mean you you're looking here i'm assuming at um multiple apartments in a single building so it's a fully controlled environment yeah. so i mean i you know you and i have both stayed in lots of um, vacation rentals i'm trying to avoid using the word beginning with a you know self-catering holiday rentals um and 
what a wild variety of uh, of experiences you actually get. Yeah, they've gone from unbelievable to oh my word, isn't this dreadful? Even you know, within the same city at roughly the same price. So much so that I I need to book hotels now for a business trip because I know what I'm going to get. So these hotel apartments, because that's essentially what they are, you know what you're going to get. And if the price is right, you know the short stay people are going to go and stay there. But that's actually not a vacation rental, is it? Correct, which also exactly kind of feeds into uh, one of my, my favorite topics that when we see conversations on LinkedIn and people giving their opinions and you just think, I think you're referring to, or you, you've got a different type of property in your mind where you've got kind of the beach, the mountains, but yeah, the urban markets, and they're so completely different. And uh, if we all kind of just throw everything in the same pot when we talk about this, I think we're, we're not uh, giving... Um, how do you say this? We're not giving this industry uh, justice. Um, so. No, we're not. I mean, the, the industry is, is is fragmented. It's fragmented in type, in size, in price, in destination, in legislation, in licensing, in taxes, in technology. I mean, it is still pretty chaotic in the Wild West, but you can see that there is a subset of funded, enterprising, smart people actually saying, well, I've, I've got 50 properties around this big front and they're all different and the owners want to use it sometimes and, you know, and there's rats in this one and, you know, it's very hard to manage the bed bugs here and all that sort of stuff. And, and they, they're thinking to themselves, well, there's an apartment block down the road. I can lease the whole building yeah. when we come back, we come back to master leasing. I got complete control over it. It's virtually the same environment as having 50 individual properties scattered around. What am I going to go for? I think we'd all go for that single property. And that's why developers are in it now. Because yeah. you know I wanted to close because we are uh we've been talking for for quite a bit now. I, there's one more question I wanted to ask you with when you were kind of working fixing bicycles for your mom's <laughs> shop and uh, selling ice cream and that sort of thing. Do you think that paved the way for you being an entrepreneur and doing your own thing rather than working for the man and kind of staying in an enterprise type of environment? Yeah, well, I think there's two things. One is working in restaurants, selling ice creams and fixing bicycles and all that sort of stuff before my mum fortunately sold the business. Um, and worked in the local council. I think that gave you a work ethic. I think the work ethic thing is is fundamental to to life. Actually, if you don't enjoy working, then life's a bit of a bitch. To be quite honest, <laughs> I think what I think what was really interesting was was the transition to being an expatriate in Saudi Arabia, because despite the fact I did a whole bunch of crazy things. I, I, you know, I did an enormous amount of exercise and various things. But what happened in 1980 was the was the advent of computers. Yeah. So you know, I, I remember 1980. I actually had a computer called a Redstone, which actually had a hard drive in it, and it had a black and white screen. And the the environment I worked in was becoming fully automated. You know, they had computer rooms. You know. The, I think my phone is probably more powerful than the, the entire computer room they had for running this entire military establishment. But that really set me off in terms of technology going forward um, and just seeing what the opportunities were. Fortunately, unfortunately, I wasn't as much of a visionary as I'd like to be. Otherwise, I'd have bought shares in all those companies like Apple and Microsoft at the time. Um, so that that helped. And then when I started uh, getting into the commercial world, I, I mean, just opened your eyes. I mean, I haven't mentioned a few things. Uh, I started another company when I was in Scotland called Eurobiosystems, and we invented the world's first vertical light photometer, which could be inserted into a PC. It won't mean anything to nearly all of you. I was just thinking, I have no idea what you, I, the only thing I understood was Scotland. Um... Yeah, well, we sold it. We sold it to a UK public company. So... 
these these things just accelerated the uh, the gray matter, I guess. And you know, you can't stand still. But one thing, I, one thing I have learned, which has become incredibly valuable, and I'm not very good at it, or haven't been very good at it, is focus. Hmm. You know, I had a, a multi-millionaire boss in a Finnish company. And despite being one of the most annoying people you could ever possibly meet, and very controlling, his comment was always, Ricard, focus. Because if you focus, you make me wealthier. <laughs> so, um, and I, I think that's really important. If you're going to do something, you really need to focus on down and what you're doing uh, and do it for a limited period of time before you, it exhausts you and then and then get out and start something else. <laughs> Those are some final words of wisdom that I'm very happy with to close the interview. Richard, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, you represent yourself as Ren with Rentivo and Yes Consulting. Uh, if there's anyone out there who doesn't know Richard, feel free to chat him up at a trade show. It's always always a pleasure. Richard, thanks so much. Yeah, well, thanks for that, Flo. And I will see you at some of the next trade shows over the next couple of months as well. So, Absolutely. yeah, keep working hard and focus. <laughs> And thanks thanks very much thank you bye